uh, when I finished my engagement with the Council of Europe at the end of 2014, I was really fed up with talking about democracy because that's what I was doing most of the time for several years without coming uh, to any sound conclusion. The big question was why democracy is in crisis, why democracy is in reverse gear worldwide. Uh, beginning of the 90s, inspired very much by uh, Fukuyama and his vision of the end of history, we believe that um, we are determined that uh, we will end up, all of us as humanity, with the ideals of liberal democracy. You remember his famous essay, which became his curse, uh, the end of uh, history. Uh, so we are now, for several years now, experiencing the question why democracy is in distress. Uh, I don't have a clear answer. I organize seminars. I uh, uh, arranged even publication of, of books, uh, including one that I'm very proud of, uh, Democracy on the Precipice, uh, where I invited um, prominent philosophers, sociologists, uh, experts in political science, ambassadors, politicians, people from different walks of life to share with us their diagnosis of the state of democracy. What is uh, puzzling for me in particular is uh, the situation in some countries which suffered uh, very harshly under authoritarian rule, which paid sometimes a heavy price from uh, going from authoritarian government to a democratic government, and who are now in a state of strange submission. They uh, look like not caring about democracy. Uh, I recently have come across with uh, figures which are really mm, shocking. Young Americans under 35 can uh, accept military dictatorship. O and only 35% of them believe that living in democracy is something important. Can you imagine in America, United States, hmm? the leader of the democratic world, 20% of young Americans are comfortable and even are expecting something like military dictatorship, which means that really democracy is in deep crisis. Uh, according to Freedom House, uh, in 2017 alone, in 72 countries, uh, a regression in terms of uh, fundamental values, political rights and freedoms was recorded, and only in 32 there was a progress, uh, which means that overall, yes, we are in decline. Of course, there are inspiring events like the Arab Spring, but even the Arab Spring, which uh, was seen as the confirmation of the prophecy of Fukuyama, we have now countries like Egypt where nobody could claim that uh, uh, the revolution undertaken several years ago brought the mm, envisaged results. And we have now Armenia. What happened in Armenia is seen in, as uh, another sign of the vitality of democratic ideals. I have seen it, I have lived through it, uh, although there are still some political uh, activists who believe that what happened in Armenia was not a revolution, simply a transfer of power. A few days ago, uh, the Prime Minister of Armenia called these guys that they are staging now a counter-revolution. What is funny about it is that um, one of the two guys who denied the democratic credentials to uh, what happened in Armenia and now are accused of being counter-revolutionary are alumni of the Moscow School. Probably they missed most of the sessions. <laughs> but at least I hope, <laughs> I hope that the Armenian friends who are here now, you're not aware of it. 
Yes, Mr. Mr. Ashotyan and Sharmazanov, they are your alumni. And, and, and they are now accused by Mr. Pashinyan as being uh, the agents of counter-revolution. Take it uh, on a joking note, please. <laughs> <laughs> Armenia is different, we, we can talk about it later, uh, but uh, what I wanted to say is, is definitely what I saw with my own eyes in Armenia can testify to the strength of democratic ideals. But I, as I said, I, when I was um, leaving um, Strasbourg, when I was uh, parting with Strasbourg at the end of 2014, I was lost. I didn't have an answer. Why this is happening? Why we are becoming, becoming so careless about um, some of our fundamental rights and, and freedoms? Uh, the most persuasive answer to this question uh, is that uh, the crisis of democracy is linked to the crisis of uh, liberalism or liberal thought. Indeed, uh, the standard model of Western democracy is called most of the time liberal democracy. So there is an element of liberalism which may explain the crisis of democracy. And after all, uh, the uh, politicians, uh, notably Prime Minister Orban of Hungary, who is the, uh, mo uh, the, the most well-known proponent of uh, an alternative, uh, uh, they speak about uh, an alternative concept of illiberal democ democracy, as if it is possible to think uh, of democracy in illiberal terms. Uh, my understanding of the illiberal democracy concept, that is a concept which gives legitimacy to the political party parties or forces who win elections, and then they can claim that they have the right to do everything because they have the mandate from the people. The opposition should uh, uh, be silent, should shut up, and wait for the nearest occasion to change the composition of power. But otherwise, the checks and balances do not matter. The independence of judiciary, the independence of the media, uh, all of this doesn't matter. That's more or less my maybe primitive understanding of the alternative concept of illiberal de democracy. Uh, is it a, a threat as things show in some European countries? Yes, the concept of illiberal de democracy at least uh, is um, put into operation, is implemented. What will be the end results of this process? Uh, we have to see. But there is a threat, a conceptual threat to, to the concept of uh, liberal democracy. You yourself, you live in a, in a country or in some countries, because it's not only about Russia, but some other post-Soviet states where uh, there was an attempt made to develop a concept which would be alternative to the liberal democracy concept that we know. The concept of managed democracy, I mean, Nikola Petrov uh, is here, who uh, s uh, wrote extensively uh, about it. Uh, so, <coughs> conceptual efforts to uh, build something alternative are there. Now, uh, driven by this explanation that the, co the crisis of the democracy uh, is uh, the result of the crisis of liberalism, I try to understand the, the nature of uh, liberalism. Uh, it was a very opportune period because the economists, I, I do not know whether you read the economists, uh, but uh, the economists in the previous weeks published a series of articles on uh, liberalism. Uh, trying to analyze the crisis of liberalism, which is again obvious for you know anybody. Uh, liberalism means different things in the United States, different in Western Europe, different in Russia, different in Central and Eastern Europe, but almost everywhere it is a negative connotation. In, in some countries it is really 
an insult. Uh, in some countries, political activists, political parties, use every opportunity not to mention the world as such. Uh, so, what is so wrong with liberalism? Again, I tried to analyze different definitions of liberalism, uh, trying to match my views with the classic concept of, of liberal thought. Liberalism starts with human dignity. The foundation of liberalism is that uh, we have uh, basic rights, inalienable rights, that you are born with something which cannot be taken away by any state or any structure. This is the concept of human dignity. And I'm very fine with it. For me, it's very precious. I believe in the uh, primacy of human dignity. Uh, the second element, at least in my understanding of liberalism, is uh, that uh, the well-being of an individual is the measure of progress of uh, society. The society and uh, all the related structures, including state, government, are as good as we as individuals can uh, note that we can live better. Uh, another important uh, virtue of uh, liberalism is that liberals believe in the progress of civilization. Uh, unlike some other currents, uh, we believe that the best is ahead of us. And the progress is a real thing, including in the moral sphere. I'm a big supporter of uh, the ideals uh, expressed in uh, the book by Steven Pinker, Better Angels of Our Nature. Uh, and I believe that also in the moral sphere, although there are serious people who believe that moral wisdom is not cumulative, but I believe that yes, we as civilization, also from the moral point of view, we are better and better. Despite, of course, the shortcomings that we can see every day. What else? Uh, we believe that um, the engine of progress is uh, in our society, and that's the internal tension. That people have different views, different expectations, different interests. Uh, and the progress is the, the fruit of this tension. And this tension is resolved by dialogue, discussion, deliberations. And the progress is based on bottom-up approach. Unlike in Marxism or some other authoritarian ideologies, where the progress is to be imposed from the upper levels down to the low levels. Liberals believe in bottom-up approach. I will not uh, go uh, into detail analyzing all the facets of the uh, liberal thought uh, but <clears throat> essentially I can agree that in our societies uh, the ideals of liberal thought are under big pressure. They are questioned and they are not uh, providing the answers to cope with the challenges of modern societies. But I can say that also other alternative ideologies are not in better shape. Look at socialism. All socialist parties of Europe, European Union countries in particular, are experiencing existential problems. Why? Because the socialist thought cannot uh, reinvent itself. Why? Because the socialist thought, since Marx, and again there were plenty of articles because of uh, his anniversary, the socialist thought was based on the idea of uh, class struggle, class conflict, uh, between the workers and the capitalists. And modern societies have essentially deprived themselves of workers. Western societies, developed societies, do not have manufacturing. And when you do not have manufacturing, you do not have workers. So what the socialist movement did? 
they compensated the lack of their natural basis with embracing the ideas of um, uh, vulnerable groups, minorities, different minorities, uh, vulnerable people in general. It works, but to an extent. I said, socialism doesn't work. Conservatism doesn't work either. The idea of conservatism to reconstruct the past and to prove that um, uh, the uh, old institutions are the best institutions doesn't work in practice. Conservatives everywhere cannot go to the public and say, okay, let's go back to the, things, to the state of things which existed 100 years ago. It doesn't work. Take British conservatives and the issue of same-sex marriages. They couldn't say that let's go back to the <laughs> situation we had 100 years ago. No, they had to you know, attack the future and be the initiators of you know, legalizing uh, same-sex marriages and so on and so forth. So nothing works. If nothing works, then you have a vacuum. Who took the vacuum? Populism. The evil of, <laughs> of all the bad things that uh, happen to democracy is populism. And populism now is the narrative of the day. You have different sorts of populism. You have right-wing populism, left-wing populism. But uh, we all suffer everywhere, at least in the Eastern Europe, in uh, Western and Eastern Europe, EU Europe, so-called, uh, from the rise of populism. And populism kills everything else. Why populism is on the rise? Three explanations from my side. The first explanation is the uh, financial crisis of 2008. The financial crisis of 2008 killed uh, or undermined one of the uh, basic uh, understandings of uh, liberal economic thought, uh, laissez-faire approach. Uh, greed is good approach. Uh, the crisis proved that the traditional liberal understanding of capitalism is not working. It undermined the confidence in the state because the state left people unprotected. They lost in material sense. They lost the real money and nobody took care of them. They lost the, and that is the most important uh, consequence of the economic crisis 2008, or financial crisis 2008, people lost faith in the elites. The crisis of democracy, the crisis of liberalism, the rise of populism is the crisis of the elites as, the, as we know them. All kinds of elites political elites, people do not believe that politicians who occupy the highest positions in governance have any vision, good vision of the future and they can bring them to that vision. People do not believe that politicians are guys with special talents. And by the way, how you make now a political career, at least in the West? You are a professional. You start very early as a junior helper during a campaign. Then you become an assistant of a politician. Then you are promoted to being a chief assistant to a, a more important politician. You try to test your skills uh, at a youth platform, youth organization. And then you run and then you spend all your life in the parliament from early age knowing that the most important thing is to win elections. All the other things are secondary. You are a technocrat, a political technocrat. Financial elites, cynical, I'm talking about the, 
the ordinary perception of the people. I don't want to in any way stigmatize them. I simply am now describing how ordinary people perceive them. These financial experts, economists, bankers in particular, after 2008 they become an alien tribe who live by their own interests, do not care about the people. All they care about is to earn more money, get more bonuses at any price. Spiritual leaders, it, it is not a, in any way linked to the financial crisis, but look at the, the big problems that the Catholic Church is now uh, experiencing in many countries of uh, uh, Europe. They are losing thousands of followers, millions even. So even the spiritual leaders do not pass the test. Meritocracy, yes, for 150 years we believed that the Western civilization is based on meritocracy as the, the driver of progress. But look at all these bureaucrats. People stop trusting them because they realize that it's another caste who are motivated by their own interest. And this also refers to international organizations like the European Union and, and the Council of Europe. Ask ordinary people, do they trust bureaucrats in Brussels? No, it's a bad world. Bad word. So, big crisis of elites. That's the issue. And because of that, we have so many, so much distrust and so many negative implications. The second reason of the crisis of liberalism, crisis of democracy, and the rise of populism, globalization. Globalization in the sense of porous borders. But this time not only porous in terms of circulation of I ideas, capital, money, but people, mass migration. Mass migration brings, of course, the alien. People who have uh, different look, different beliefs, different uh, eating habits, different everything. For the big cities of uh, the West, Paris, London, it's nothing new. They are people who live there, they are really accustomed to diversity. Uh, but these different people started appearing in small villages, in remote places. What happened? That uh, many, sometimes quite decent people, in particular of the old generation, developed a feeling that they are no longer the masters of the future. They, they are no longer at home. They would accept the world being different, provided it stops at the doors. But suddenly, this different world crossed the doorsteps. What was the result? Disorientation. But most of all, they started seeking protection from the loss of their identity or the pressure on their identity. They started to be ready to cede, to yield the feeling of freedom for the sake of protection. Protection by a state, by a tribe, by a congregation. They fell into the state of submission obedience. They didn't care to feel free, to be the sovereign in political sense. They needed somebody who would lead them somewhere. And that's the, the basis for the demand for leadership, strong leader, and the open door for populism. Because that's how populism comes into our hearts. When somebody with a high level of self-confidence says, 
I know the answer, simply follow me. Don't ask the questions. Follow me, you will see. So that's the second reason of uh, why we have problems with democracy. We are falling into a state of mind, close to submission, to obedience. I uh, always uh, advise young people in particular to look the movie or, or read an article about uh, Professor Migram's experiment on obedience. It was a guy who, who thought, uh, who tried to explain who tried to explain what happened during the Second World War. Why so many people followed anti-human orders. And he thought that some nations have this gene of obedience more developed than the others. But he came to the conclusion that we are all equal. We have a gene of obedience and sometimes we simply obey. Although we know that we are not doing the right thing. The third reason why uh, liberalism is uh, in decline is, of course, uh, the technological revolution. The problem is that uh, the technological progress is going in an exponential way, while our ability to adapt to this uh, pace of progress is still linear. There is a growing discrepancy between the pace of the technological programs and the ability of us and indivi as individuals, our social norms and institutions, and our political institutions to the pace of the technological uh, progress. I am already of this generation who can say, yes, I cannot cope, <laughs> which means that there are uh, including uh, the, the number of applications and uh, gadgets that I cannot use because I do not have patience to learn how to operate them is growing. You are lucky, you are still very young and for you it's, I mean, <laughs> it's a matter of course. But for many people, uh, the, the, mm, this wave of to technological change is difficult to accept and to cope with. And it's not really about manual capability or, or uh, what I'm saying now, uh, these things that ha you do not know how to use all these applications and possibilities. It is about psychological things. The meaning of privacy. One of uh, the many things that divide me from you is that I have the old sense of privacy which is completely out of tune with what the, the technology is bringing to our societies. You accept that you have no private life. I cannot accept it. That's why I'm not on Facebook. Don't try to look for me at first. Or Instagram, or any of it. Because I'm unfashioned. So privacy is one of the things that, you know, we simply have difficulty to adjust. In social terms, there are many things which um, we have to change and we have a difficulty to accept them, in particular the, young, the old generation. Look the big, at the big cultural change. Oh, we mentioned, for instance, same-sex marriages. The situation now and situation 50 years ago. And think about the old guys who have a difficulty to accept the big change of our uh, social norm. Uh, but it's even, you know, if you if you look at uh, inter-ethnic or inter-confessional uh, marriages. You know, I spent nine years in Alsace. Uh, for instance, when you look at the co uh, uh, dresses for girls, I was ex explained that, because I asked why <coughs> in some dresses the buttons are round and in other they are rectangular. What, why you need this difference? And I was explained. It was very simple. Because a Catholic girl had to have round but, uh, but, buttons, a Protestant girl uh, rectangular. So that a young guy from a distance 
could tell whether he has a chance or not. If he was a Protestant, he should avoid round buttons. Hmm? It's funny now. But it was the situation even less than 100 years ago. So what I'm telling you is that uh, this technological revolution uh, puts our uh, individual uh, uh, norms, our social norms and institutions under big stress. And of course political institutions. We take everything for granted uh, in terms of how our democracy works. But if you look back, all the uh, essential institutions of our political systems were invented not so long ago. Political parties as we know it is 100 years ago. Elections, even less. As you know, most countries uh, allowed women to vote only after the Second World War. There were only a few before this, in Europe at least. The last canton of Switzerland where women were allowed to vote was uh, up until in 1993. Parliament, is, this is a novelty, in relative terms, of course. And we take everything for granted. And uh, I believe, and uh, I devoted one uh, of my lectures at, at one of the schools of political studies, that we are uh, at the advent of a big change in the way we perceive political institutions and the way we expect them to work. And we have already some experiments. Uh, the liquid democracy concept, for instance. It is a reaction to, to the things that uh, we find the existing political institutions too conservative. Uh, not matching our expectations, in particular in the age of internet, social media, and so on and so forth. So, <coughs> this is the big thing. Uh, technology. And where technology will take us. Today there are two big direct challenges to democracy uh, stemming from technology. One is surveillance, the other is big data. Surveillance because we cannot, or we can but with difficulty, make our political preferences private and secret. We are exposed because we are under constant surveillance. The face recognition technology will make all our assemblies public, which means, as already is happening in some countries, uh, people who take part in political assemblies, they can be identified by every single name. Every street you cross, in particular on the red light in some countries, is properly notified. People are talking now about the big experiment in China, you probably have heard about it. This is the social credit rating. Uh, and there is one big uh, city in China which is uh, implementing it at full scale. Which means that every citizen receives bonuses or uh, he loses points depending how he behaves. If he crosses the street on a red line, he is notified that he is losing a point. If he doesn't pay a fine in time, traffic, speeding, he loses a point. If he misbehaves on a flight, he loses a point. If he behaves well, he earns points. If he earns enough, he can get a free access to a gym or to a spa. If he scores too many negative points, he cannot fly. He cannot even take a train. Uh, scary, isn't it? <laughs> but it's not science fiction movie. It is happening right now. <laughs> so that's the technology. Total surveillance. The other aspect, big data. Big data. What is about big data? Some people already say that uh, who controls data controls the future. 
I know that in Russia you still believe that who controls, controls oil and gas controls the future. <laughs> but the conventional wisdom is now who controls data controls the future. Uh, big data allows people who uh, control it manipulate our choices. In theory we are three, but in practice not quite. Already now Amazon knows better which books I should read and buy, which drives me crazy, but that's how it works. Every <laughs> major web, <laughs> web page selling something will tell you exactly what you need. Again, scary. The whole idea, which is very successful, applied by Trump, is to win elections by micro-targeting. Micro-targeting means that using uh, big data, uh, the campaign organizers can exactly know what kind of message should be sent to what kind of people. And it works. The big success stories like um, Trump election, Brexit were based on uh, Brexit referendum were based on micro-targeting. And that's the new evil of democracy. Micro-targeting. Good. So, <coughs> where are we now? And what to do? How to defend ourselves? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, I believe that uh, we will be able to uh, reinvent democracy. I, I still believe that there are certain fundamental uh, rights and freedoms that are important for our identity. And I believe in our capacity, in our determination as human beings to defend our freedoms. But first of all, I believe that we should define what kind of freedoms are important to us. I try to look at the wall. Uh, we are changing and of course we are developing new generation of human rights. I spent some years in the Strasbourg, uh, in the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, and that's their favorite pastime, to develop new rights. The list is now very long. But like at every juncture, in particular difficult juncture uh, in our history, we have to decide what is more important to us, what is less important. To some of you, the freedom to travel is the most important. Maybe. To others, the right to speak. Uh, to others, the freedom of conscience, maybe. Which used to be the most fundamental right 300 years ago. The religious wars were driven by uh, uh, our feeling that the priority above all the rights and freedoms belongs to the freedom of conscience. So what is the most important freedom that uh, we believe today is valid. I leave it the question open because this is something we have to answer ourselves. I don't uh, have any answer to impose on you. Uh, good. <laughs>